Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Day of the Climate Professional. My name is Kastia. I'm the founder and CEO of Youth Climate Leaders. And if you arrived just now because a friend invited you, you might be asking yourself, what is YCL? And according to one of our main partners, which will be speaking across the day, uh, YCL is the most awesome thing someone ever thought about. But our official slogan is really more modest. We train and connect young people with opportunities to start their careers on climate change. We have now more than 300 fellows from over 20 countries, and our goal is to reach 1 million members by 2030. Our success is due to increased demand and awareness about climate change in the last decade, which resulted in more people wanting to do something about it. YCL offers solutions to help young people tackle two main challenges that threaten their future in this century, the climate crisis and the structure unemployment. Although young people make up the majority of the global population, they continue to encounter barriers to job opportunities and economic security while dealing with an uncertain future due to the climate crisis. We are responding to this complex problem with three main components. First, we have learning journeys where they can learn more about climate change in theory and experience its, its challenges in practice through hands-on projects with partner organizations and lectures from leading climate professionals, many of which will be panelists such as Alex, which is joining us today. The second pillar is the YCL network, a global community of practice with members from different countries and areas of expertise, which interacts online and develop projects at local hubs worldwide. We already have hubs in Brazil, US, Portugal, and Italy, and our plan is to expand exponentially in the next few years. The, the third and perhaps um, the most important pillar is what we are doing today, which is provide access to uh, professional, which is provide access to professional opportunities. Members of the YCL network have access to mentorship, climate vacancies, and participation in global events. In fact, few of them are today with us in this virtual audience. Our main goal is to empower a diverse group of young leaders from all over the world with the leadership and entrepreneurial skills to be used right now to address climate change. With this unique approach, we thus transform a daunting challenge as the climate crisis into an opportunity to include millions of young people through the emerging climate economy. I will talk more about the climate crisis later on, but first I'd like to focus on the unemployment threats which I'm sure is an issue for all cities and countries joining us today. Today, a young person is three times more likely to be in employment than adults, even as collectively they represent the largest percentage of the world's potential labor force. And current events with the COVID-19 pandemic have furthered uh, this exasperation, uh, putting millions of uh, young people at risk of economic and social exclusion, while stressing underlining gender issues. More than one third of all young women in the world are jobless and not in education or training. The International Labor Organization estimates that one in each six young people has lost their jobs due to the pandemic. In Latin America, about 22% of youth do not work nor study. In Brazil, more specific, where we started the organization, it is estimated that unemployment for people from 14 to 29 years old rose from 27.7% in the first quarter of 2020, this year, to 38.8% in the last quarter of the same year. This accounts for 7.9 million unemployment youth. This without considering those who are not looking for employment for various reasons, such as lack of hope to find. In Brazil, too, 41% of young people with university degrees do not have qualified jobs. And I'm sure the rates are concerning all over the world as well. We must do something to revert the situation. And if we do not act quick enough, we may lose this generation. A study shows that generations who enter in the labor force uh, during times of financial crisis may have lower incomes throughout their whole lives compared to older generations. For few millennials, this is the second large financial crisis that we are experiencing the first decade of the, our careers. Can we afford that? The good news is that tackling the climate crisis may also be a unique opportunity to include millions of young people 
and older people too in the new climate economy. A study from the World Resources Institute called A New Economy to a New Age shows that if we implement today the low carbon policies we need, this can result in an increase in the projected Brazilian GDP of 2.8 trillion reais and generate 2 million more jobs than the business as usual scenario. We cannot miss this opportunity. Policies to stimulate the economy and rebuild societies after the pandemic must do channel efforts and resourcing projects which are making cities and countries more resilient to the climate crisis. So instead of building new coal mines, we should invest in uh, um, boot camps that will train people on how to install solar panels, for example. And this is something that YCL wants to do with uh, cities that are watching us and are interested in such activities. And I'm currently living in Europe uh, to launch YCL headquarters here. And many people ask me why youth in Brazil or other developing countries are not as engaged as European youth on climate change. My answer is that most developing and emerging countries, most of them, young people cannot afford to be full-time activists. They, they have to help their families with income and with very little time to spare, they have difficulties joining the climate movement, but we have a solution for this. And our solution is simple. Young people should get paid to work with what they believe. Their cause can be their job and we want to help them in this process. It is not an easy journey. And after they are aware about the climate risks and they want to do something about it, they still lack funding, networks and legitimacy to have a, minimal, meaning, to have a meaningful contribution. At the same time, organizations at the forefront are struggling to hire the young talent they, that will bring the fresh perspectives and resources needed to boost their climate projects. Therefore, we created the Day of the Climate Professional that we are here today on November 24, 2020 to celebrate and highlight all professionals that are doing the, their best to combat the climate crisis. In this inaugural edition, we are convening a virtual summit featuring a marathon of 24 hours of online events. And this is the first one. So bear with us. You can watch later if you want. Of course, most of you will not be awake for 24 hours. You don't have to. And, but we hope to engage over 20,000 participants over these 24 hours. We invited more than 100 employer organizations and gathered over 500 vacancies on our website, which we are going to share the link throughout this, um, this panel. After all, we believe that we can catalyze climate action and fight unemployment through the presentation of concrete professional opportunities in the area. And to kick off this amazing event, we will have a conversation about the future of work. And with us today, we have Alex Brethas, author and facilitator of auto learning communities, and Tom Moore, from Mandala. But before we start, we are very honored to have, uh, and we want to thank Fritjof Capra, who sent us a brief video to talk about the relationship between the pandemic we are living and the climate crisis. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody, and greetings from my home in Berkeley, California. I would like to present a systemic analysis of the COVID-19 pandemic. In my view, the coronavirus must be seen as a biological response of Gaia, our living planet, to the ecological and social emergency that humanity has brought upon itself. It arose from an ecological imbalance and has dramatic consequences because of social and economic imbalances. Massive intrusions into ecosystems around the world, fueled by corporate greed, have fragmented these systems and have fractured the web of life. One of the many consequences of these destructive activities has been that uh, viruses which lived in symbiosis with certain animal species where they did no harm, jumped from those species to humans where they were highly toxic or deadly. 
the coronavirus jumped from a species of bats to humans in China and from there rapidly spread around the world. Population density is the key variable in the spread of COVID-19 and population density is often a consequence of excessive profit maximizing, whether we talk about giant cruise ships or other forms of mass tourism, giant supermarkets or crowded living conditions caused by social and economic uh, inequality. During a pandemic like COVID-19, social justice is no longer a political issue of left versus right, but becomes an issue of life and death. When the pandemic spread around the world, one country after the other went into lockdown. As a consequence, transportation of people and goods decreased dramatically, businesses closed and unemployment soared. So the worldwide health crisis is going hand in hand with the worldwide economic crisis. However, from a planetary ecological point of view, there have also been many positive consequences. As automobile traffic and industrial activities decreased dramatically, the pollution of major cities around the world suddenly disappeared. And we can now once again enjoy clear skies and clean air. As giant cruise ships no longer enter the Venetian lagoon and other tourists stay at home, the canals of Venice have become so clear that fish can be seen again. Wildlife is flourishing around the world in ecosystems undisturbed by humans. The coronavirus has already been more effective in reducing CO2 emissions and slowing down climate breakdown than all the world's policy initiatives combined. Now, this does not mean that we want to continue living in the current situation. The current environmental regeneration has been the result of radically reduced human activities. The same positive effects could be achieved by radically changing human activities. The world's COVID-19 response has shown us what is possible when people realize that their lives are at stake. Will we have the wisdom and the political will to apply this lesson to the climate crisis? If we succeed in doing so, future historians may conclude that even though COVID-19 had widespread tragic consequences for countless individuals and communities around the world, it may have saved humanity and large parts of the community of life from extinction. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the video. And now uh, I will go back to our panel. We could not host an event in 2020 without mentioning the pandemic we are facing. And as Fritjof Capra said, although the pandemic has had short-term po positive effects on climate change, we have to find better ways to reduce CO2 emissions. As we publish on our website in March, there is a lot we can learn from the global response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we should aspire to an even larger shift in society. The pandemic also accelerated some of the future trends for work and education, such as e-learning, mass deployment of home office, and flexible working hours. Alex, thank you very much for being with us. And one of the key trends related to the future of work is lifelong learning. No matter which degrees we have, everything gets obsolete quicker and we are likely to have several different jobs throughout our, our lives, for which we will need constantly reskilling. How can we navigate these new learning demands? First of all, hi Cassia, hi Tom. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for this awesome invitation. And I'm really happy to be here also because I really admire the YCL work. I think it's 
really genius. So about this question, actually, climate change, let me talk a little bit about that first, although I'm not a specialist, but although it is being studied for a long time now, climate change has not yet been transformed into a formal education option in college and universities. So people who want to go deep web have to learn how to learn by themselves. And even if we had a degree on climate change available, people would still need to learn by themselves because it is a subject that changes really fast. Also, it is a very innovative and transdisciplinary area. So informal and what I call self-directed learning can really contribute to approach it in a holistic and out of the box way. So lifelong learning actually has its roots in the United Nations in the 70s. And global leaders were worried that the changes in labor and skills would be so brutal and fast that only school-based formal education would not be enough. So if it, was, if it was true 50 years ago, now it's even more. Yeah, we can agree on that. And besides the economic and labor challenges, we have, as we know, social, political, and environmental challenges as well. So lifelong learning in this sense is the skill we need to develop in order not only to thrive professionally, but to have a meaningful and healthy life, and also to do our job tackling local and global challenges. And the challenges we are facing now are not our new ones, actually. The COVID-19 crisis is the proof of that. And these challenges have like a growing complexity on them. And the traditional educational model, the one that we got from school, is terribly bad at dealing with complexity. Although science has already evolved to embody more complex and systemic approaches, school and the hegemonic educational paradigm are not there yet. So we need to really rethink schooling and this paradigm from the ground up. I'm writing a book with some friends about self-directed learning communities, which is my work right now. And in, in one of the chapters, we write about some of the beliefs that schooling imposes on us. I will read some of them here. So, I am not able to learn without a teacher. Learning equals being taught. There are people who are geniuses, people with normal intelligence and people below average. There is only one type of intelligence, measured by IQ and test scores. The subjects that interest me are not important. What matters is what is within the official curriculum. I will only learn if I make a lot of reading and master all theories. The accumulation of degrees is the only way to succeed in life. So, we could have so much more, right? I think we have to unlearn all these in order to become what I call a lifelong learner. And lifelong learning is learning through your whole life and also in the different contexts of life, not only professional. Actually, this learning, this different context of life is what we call life-wide learning, lifelong learning and life-wide learning. And how can we do that? One answer would be to enroll in many courses after you leave school or university. But education should not be only made of courses and lectures. The main thing we can do in order to become lifelong learners is to become self-directed learners. A self-directed learner knows how to seek and create opportunities for himself to learn based upon his or her interests and needs in life. He knows that education is not about only content but also about experiences, people, networks, and different kinds of resources. So this person creates and takes part in experiences, tries to reach people in order to learn from them, and navigates in different communities and networks to be fully updated about what's going on. So we see that lifelong learning is a broad concept, and I really believe that we have to become self-directed learners in order to do that practically. Oh, thank you. And I think I'm very happy to hear your, and I would like to read your book uh, because this is what we are trying to do with YCL. Like we just launched today for the Day of the Climate Professional, the new cohort of the YCL course. 
and that's exactly what we are hoping to have like we this is like lifelong learning as you said a course is not enough that's why we have the network and through the network they can still uh, interact with other people propose uh, and even be the facilitators of the course as happened in the last cohort so it's really nice to see these possibilities and how is important to also dedicate a time to learn how to learn but we are going to talk more about this later on so thank you very much for being with us uh, mandala works with conscious innovation and the organization's website says that the future of business lies in the symbiosis between profit and purpose how does that work Garcia, first thank you so much for the invitation very kind of you Great to be here with Alex as well. Great to see you, Alex. Um, and congratulations on all the work. Amazing. And your introduction really showed to me, and I think showed to all of us, the, the critical importance of, of the work that you're doing at YCL. And so, firstly, congratulations. Um, and thank you for the invite. Uh, in, term, in terms of Mandala, in terms of the, the idea of conscious innovation, um, I think when Mandala created that concept, we were trying to qualify innovation. So I think we hear the word innovation a lot these days, and we've heard it for quite a while. Um, but innovating just for innovation's sake um, isn't good, is, is actually dangerous. We can just produce more products and they're just going out there and they flop in the market and they're not successful. Um, so we need to qualify innovation. Just innovating for innovation's sake is not the way to do it. So we need to qualify um, what, we, what we do. And so we brought this idea of conscious innovation basically to say that, yes, we do need innovation because there's the great side of entrepreneurialism, generating new values. Now, we love this. You know, our societies need people that have that drive, who want to create new things, who want to create new uh, value for, for people. We need that. But it needs to be balanced. So it can be a new product, a service, a strategy, a culture, whatever it is. But by being conscious, you are generating social value at the same time. Um, so, and really the, the point here is that there's no trade-off between those traditional financial metrics of market share or, or profit of your organization and generating social value. So what's actually going on here, um, and Mandala is certainly not the only ones, it's certainly a bigger movement that's going on, is that, that, that there's a shift. It, there's this idea that um, uh, you're either sustainable or thinking about the planet or thinking about society or you're generating profit is over. We're into a completely new paradigm of not just innovating but running our businesses, um, which is, and I think that for you and for people watching now, it's no big new, new news, but this idea of, of purpose uh, and being purpose-driven in our organizations is kind of, is kind of where we're at. Um, just going back with, with Mandala, when we started talking about this idea of purpose, so this idea that your organization has a higher objective beyond profit, profit comes as a consequence, uh, the idea that you have this sort of motor or, or drive that's within you, that's driving you to create some positive difference in the world. When we started talking about this, which was sort of, you know, uh, a decade or more or so ago, um, you know, people, we'd, we'd go into meetings and people would sort of look at us and not have a clue what we were talking about, not understand what was this funny word called purpose. They'd look at us like we had two heads. It was this strange sort of, you know, moment. And, um, you know, and for a long time, Mandala had these, we had these two circles, right? So. This is kind of like, this is describing what we did as an organization. We had these two circles. Um, one was profit and one was purpose. And then there was this intersection in the middle. And we kind of said, look, that's where Mandala works. That's the work that we do with our clients to help them to understand the connection between it. And for many, many years, that graphic was a perfect description, a perfect representation of who we were and what we did. But then, this is kind of the, the interesting recent development of this over the last two or three years when we started to walk into client com communications or, or relationship or, or meetings or whatever and we presented this graphic actually people sort of kind of said yeah we already know that you know we've, we've already got so sort of conceptually the idea of purpose 
has started. It's not hasn't started. It's in the mainstream now. That's been the big shift that's taken place over the last few years. So um, instead of us being sort of talking about something completely new, this is now part of the business mainstream. So with this, there's a shift in terms of um, the challenge of purpose. The challenge of purpose now is less one of telling people what the, the, the concept is and sort of getting people on board. The major challenge now is one, linking to your point, Cassie, earlier on, is about action. It's about activation. The challenge that a lot of organizations are having now is they get it conceptually, but actually to migrate truly, fully, operationally to this new model um, requires a lot of discipline, requires a lot of action, and isn't, that isn't easy, right? Um, so, so that really is the, the work of Mandala, to, to help these organizations to migrate from that old way of doing business into this new way of doing business, which um, ultimately, if we talk about purpose being the why, then if we just sort of say, well, why, why the why? Why are we talking about purpose so much? The, the key thing here, and I think it totally connects to our challenge today in terms of the climate crisis. The key point is that the old model of capitalism, the, the, the shareholder maximization model, brought us a lot of benefits in terms of a society in many ways, uh, and there's a lot to recommend it, but it's a poor system. It's a system that has brought huge, huge problems for us at the same time. It's, it's brought us to this point in terms of environmental degradation uh, and in terms of the climate crisis. It's brought us to this point in terms of major uh, inequality in terms of our societies. It's brought a complete crisis of trust in terms of our institutions. And so the benefits that we've gained over these recent decades have come at a tremendous cost. And purpose is like the, at the organizational level, it's the fuel, it's the motor to help us to take the next step, to evolve this model into a, a form of capitalism, which is you know, more moral, more innovative, uh, uh, better, uh, and ultimately better suited for who we are today and what we're trying to do in the world. Uh, that's great, uh, and I really like what you mentioned about like uh, solving real problems. When I was doing my master's in the U.S., uh, we discussed oftentimes the entrepreneurship that comes from developing countries versus the first world problems and all. Uh, so, for example, we will have a partner speaking later on today, Thought for Food, that they work with several entrepreneurs uh, in the area of food. So I have seen some of them in India, for example, that developed ways that you can reduce food waste without using uh, any electricity, that they can transport the food without wasting. And this is like using less resources and solving a real problem, where sometimes you can see in, the, in San Francisco and other places, so much uh, resources for uh, building a new app for donuts. Uh, it's not a real problem. You know? like We can do this, but should we do this? And I really like, uh, uh, again, uh, Capra's video, and I think uh, uh, it's a coincidence, a good one, but this year I read his book, like The Science of Leonardo, and I really like the intro on the Portuguese version that Oscar Motomura asks, what would happen if, if we united all Leonardo's of today, and, and I would say Maria's too, not only Leonardo's, millions of them, uh, and join forces to solve the greatest problems of this century. What would happen if we directed all the human plantation and geniality to quickly solve these issues? So I think that's what, precisely what we are trying to do with youth climate leaders, with our hubs, is to get all this passion from young people instead of uh, now they feel powerless, they feel depressed. We are going to have a, a, one of our last panels about climate anxiety. But if we have um, a way to, to mentor them and to put them uh, in contact with the real solutions, they will, it will help us. We need everyone in this, in this battle. So going back to Alex, uh, you were one of the facilitators of the last cohort of the YCL course, and you mentioned the need for courage and passion to go beyond what is expected from us. What kind of leaders do we need to create the future that wants to emerge while tackling complex issues such as climate change, unemployment, inequality, among others? 
Yeah, thank you, Cassia. This is a really great question. And I, I think in a way, not only leaders will have to develop a new skill set, but actually all of us. And I wrote a book with some friends. <laughs> I write many books, as you will see. That was released a few months ago. And it was called Core Skills, 10 Skills for a Changing World. It was in Portuguese, but I'm making a translation here in English. And this concept of core skills emerged after a deep and wide research we did into the field of soft and hard skills. And every year, like different international organizations such as the UN, OECD, and many others, as you know, published their lists of the most important skills for professionals in the future. And after we reading and we were reading and digging into a lot of these lists, we found that there was such a, a kind of a core, which is to say there were some virtues or maybe attitudes that one could develop in order to acquire many of the most important soft and hard skills. And for me and these, the other co-authors of the book, we usually say that the core skills are neither hard or soft, they are essential. So we're talking about self-balance, empathy, courage, as you mentioned, community building, trust, authenticity, creativity, influence, curiosity, and self-directed learning. These are the 10. So these are skills that will help us achieve any personal or professional goal. And that, that at the same time, we will contribute to solve some of the major global challenges with them. But let me dive a little bit more into the question subject that you asked, which is leaders. From the many core skills we studied, I really believe that the complex challenges of the future will demand leaders that are willing to learn and unlearn, that know how to build strong communities and movements as well, and also leaders that are brave enough to challenge the mainstream and really think and move forward. So we are talking here about three of the 10 core skills, self directed learning, community building, and courage. So as I talked about self directed learning before, let me just add two more things directly related to leaders. In my vision, leaders need to learn how to be radically humble in order to maximize their learning ability. I'm writing a book again about humility the name will be the pleasure of being wrong because i truly understand that without this skill we freeze our development and worse we behind other people's learning so as leaders must nurture this weird kind of pleasure the pleasure of being wrong which means having a radically open perspective about everything and actively challenging their own understanding of a subject when we're wrong we, when we humans are wrong, the human tendency is to turn on the fight or flight mode, which then turns easily into arrogance, hostility, and competition. And we must learn how to quickly overcome this feeling, this fight or flight mode, in order to feel that this kind of pleasure that comes next, the pleasure of having a new perspective, the pleasure of having new possibilities of understanding and action in the world. The second skill that I wanted to bring here for leaders specifically is community building. I really love communities and this is my work, the main of my work right now. Community is a well spread word these days, but I think we're using it in some superficial ways. For me, communities is a special kind of group in which people can feel at home, which is to say they feel like they can be a hundred percent themselves by doing that they connect deeply with other people and share their vulnerability and all this strengthen the common purpose of the community so communities usually have three main purposes that are frequently intertwined to work and to create things together to learn together and to live together which means to connect with other people leaders need to understand that people will only engage and act fully if they feel a sense of belonging with this community. A book that really shows how leaders and other people can build community 
is the Art of Community by Charles Vaux, and I really, really recommend it. I won't be able here to say all the things that I wanted to say about community, so I strongly recommend The Art of Community by Charles Vaux. This book is one of the best that I read recently about this subject. And for finally, the third core skill that I really think leaders must strengthen is courage, as you mentioned. But I'm not talking here about courage to aggressively grow companies or cut costs. These, these are kind of ordinary things to expect from a business leader, and they are not what we need, re what we need, re need right now. We need leaders to question their basic assumptions about more profound things like life on Earth, about our existence as human beings, about the many other forms of life, and what is the legacy we want to leave after we die. This requires a lot of courage, and it requires even more to accept and embrace the implications of this deep reflection. If we look at leaders that are really changing or changing the landscape in different fields, including climate change, such as Greta Thunberg, Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, and many others, we will see that they were brave enough to kind of swim against the tide. And they only did it because they were truly self-directed learners, because they knew how to build strong communities around them, and because they had a big why to guide their quests, just like Tom said. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, and going back to Tom, uh, most young people who approach YCL are looking for jobs and careers that combine purpose, impact, and a good work environment. Therefore, organizational culture is paramount for ensuring that these goals. How did Mandala develop uh, their, your culture, and which tips do you have for leaders watching us who will also want to create a better culture in their organizations? Well, firstly, I think the question is great because you're emphasizing the importance of culture and you're emphasizing the importance of young people coming into the workforce and, and kind of demanding to work in a place that has a good culture, right? You know, I want to work there and I don't want to work there. You know what I mean? It's like, why? Because it's meaningful, purposeful. The values connect with mine. It's a good culture. I think that's brilliant because it kind of, it cuts both ways, this thing. About, um, about culture. Cassie, it really hit me when you were in your introduction, when you sort of said, look, you know, some of the, some of the young people that are in the uh, workforce today have sort of gone through their second crisis of their careers, you know, and, it, and the reality is it does affect you, right? When you come into the workforce, you come in one year or one generation or another, it completely, uh, it, it doesn't dictate everything about how your career is gonna pan out. But it, but it does, you, you, you know, some generations are luckier than others. You can't, you know, you, and I, so I do really feel that. But I think that there's something really amazing going on in terms of organizational culture, which is that young people are coming into the workforce and demanding that. You know, I want to work in a place that's connected to my values. And I think that's brilliant because that brings change. And, you know, ultimately organizations are people, right? That's all it is. You know, we think about them as these sort of amazing, it's just groups of people. And so if we can bring new people with new ideas into it, the culture really does change. So I think that's, that's great. I think culture is definitely changing as well. It's, it's definitely growing in importance. In our work in Mandala, we see uh, over the last years, more organizations really thinking about what is our organizational culture. And instead of that being a sort of, a sort of something in the background, this is something really valuable for what we're, who we are because it's unique. It makes us what, what, we, what we do, right? In terms of Mandala and like how did Mandala develop its culture, um, I think there's lots of things here. I think obviously the, 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 the founders of Mandala, Lorenzo and, and, and Igor, who founded the organization, took a great care of culture from the very beginning. Um, and so I think when you're a smaller organization um, and, and a younger organization, you have more opportunity to sort of just put into practice straight away your own ideas and your beliefs and your values and when you're in a big big you know organization it can take a little while longer to kind of shift it's like a sort of ocean liner and you're trying to move it from one place to another but i think that you know well what is culture right culture is this sort of mix of um values and beliefs 
and our behaviors and then the systems that we put into the organization to reinforce all of this right so i think at mandala there was there was lots of things that stood out but there was a big focus on what we call now right the employee experience so you know a, a nice place to work in terms of an office um, there was a certain flexibility around the, the the work times that you 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 know there was a but there was also a big focus on results you know and, and getting things done um so uh, there was this we had amazing food for example we had like a lovely kind of lunch it's a beautiful vegetarian lunch and everybody's you know very happy it's it is stuff of, of sort of taking care of people and look thinking about well-being in a sort of slightly wider way than perhaps more traditional businesses have done um, but I think the, the big thing with culture is this idea that there are sort of tensions, right? So when we think about um, an innovative culture, we think, oh, everybody needs to experiment and they need to fail. And that's kind of true. But then you also need to sort of say, yes, experimentation, but also let's have a lot of discipline. Let's be very rigorous. You know, somebody can fail, but also let's not accept bad performance or bad behavior. Do you know what I mean? So there's these sort of, you've got to hold these tensions. Uh, within your organization where you're being generous and thinking of the individual and thinking of the, the human being ultimately and not the employee um, but at the same time holding each other to really high standards and not letting that slip ever um, because that's when you can create really good cultures I think it's a it's a mix of that of the rational and the emotional it's a mix of um, being reasonable and sort of applying common sense but then also holding each other to account uh, and I think that idea of accountability is 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 really important. So, yeah, I mean, those are those are some of the some of the ideas of uh, of how it was done at Mandala. Anyway, no, that's great. And whenever you have vacancies, please share because I'm sure a lot of our uh, viewers now want to perhaps apply to a job at Mandala, and uh, we, a lot of young people are looking exactly for this kind of environment. Um, and also you mentioned vegetarian food, just to remember that these, um, over these 24 hours, we'll have three uh, panels about food and agriculture, two of them in English, one in Portuguese. So we are going to also discuss all the issues related to food and, and, uh, and it's a, a big trend on our uh, community, I would say, like reducing meat consumption. Uh, and, and even for myself, I started as an environmentalist because I became a vegetarian first, which was probably the opposite uh, pathway. I was 14 and it's interesting to see because when I was kind of revolted with everything and, and almost like Lisa Simpson in the episode that she became vegetarian, I wanted just to throw a flip the table and everything. Uh, but at, over time, like we found better ways of activism and and it's really impressive to see how things change so fast because in the, it's been like I don't know, over like 10 years and uh, now I see many more options, like half of our membership is vegetarian, the other half is reducing. So we perhaps we can oversee, like we can think about a future where food habits will be totally different. And a lot of people, most of them older, will tell me and other, other young people that this is impossible. And they still do, but we are like uh, perhaps ahead of them and we are seeing this trend. So I think uh, going back to complex problems, how important it is to as Otto Scharmer mentioned, to be able to feel the future that is emerging. Because if you just think with the mindset of the past, you're not going to see these trends. There is a funny anecdote that in, in New York, they used to think that the main issue for the last century, the 20th century, would be there would be too many horses in the city. So there would be a lot of excrements. And that's what not happened. So nobody thought that there would be a new technology that will over troll the horses from the city. And I, I believe that working with climate change and all these complex issues, we have to be these ones that will say, maybe you're not right, maybe there's something coming. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what, but I will try to figure out and bring more people from my network and discuss as we are doing here. And talking about this, like this is a question to both of you. And as we, uh, we might have some time for you also to ask a question to each other so you can think later on. But uh, uh, one uh, webinar that we did with our partner, Wake Carbon, Enrique, which is the CEO of the organization, highlighted five skills for climate professionals. One, the ability to learn and unlearn, that I think Alex talked a lot of it. Um, two, work as ecosystem instead of a closed silos. 
Three, navigate the digital and physical worlds. And now with the pandemic, this is even more true. Uh, four, creativity. And five, resilience. Would you add any other skills or advice for emerging climate professionals that are watching us now? Can I begin, Tom? Yes. <laughs> sure. Well, I, I think this question is also really interesting. I was thinking that, I was remembering actually, that I watched this speech from John Hegel, and he talked about a curious advice that he gave to his daughter, and I really loved it. He said that the only advice that he would ever give her in terms of her professional life would be for her to find her passion and then learn how to make a living from it. This is the only thing you, you need, you will ever need in terms of professional success. And I really admire this perspective and I use it in my life as well. So maybe for many people that are watching us right now, climate change and its consequences, maybe this passion, this really big purpose, and it will drive you to overcome all the obstacles that you may find. And my further advice would be like, um, complimenting John Hager would be, once you discover that passion, which can change over time, um, you have to be really specific in terms of where and how you can create value from it. Yes. Once again, John Hegel says that you have to go to the edges of the system. And this is really similar to a thing that Otto Scharmer says as well. The places in which you can explore, you can learn fast, and then you can create new solutions that maybe nobody has thought about before. And all self-directed learners that I know really share this thing in common. They are not satisfied in reproducing the existing reality. They are really passionate about creating new stuff. Maybe even if they are in, inside a company, they don't have to be entrepreneurs to do that. And the way to do that is to experiment fast, make mistakes, learn, and then try again. There is no other way. And the faster you can test your prototypes, your tests, gather feedback, and improve them, the faster you'll be able to create new relevant stuff that really adds value to your field. So maybe I'm not adding some new skill sets to the list that you mentioned, Cassie, but maybe I'm trying to explain a little bit of some of the nuances of them. I think that's great. And this advice is really good. My father, which is also a facilitator for the YCL course, gave me something similar, you know, like, because uh, when we are looking for a job, you think what will give more money or like people think that this is promising. But he told me, if you are good on what you want to do and, you, and he, it's something that is related to your purpose, you are going to be among the best of that. So it doesn't matter the field that you are choosing. And this is something that we talk about oftentimes, uh, the relationship between uh, vocation, vocação in Portuguese, and, and purpose because they are different things sometimes and, and for YCL you can you, it doesn't matter your vocation if you are like a, 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 a nutritionist or like an engineer you can still uh, direct this vocation to the purpose of climate change so this is very important that's why we have so many diverse speakers today to prove to you call your your father, your mother, send to your, all your family, like that's a, a promising field, I assure you. Well, Tom, what is your take on this? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Just when Alex was talking there, um, obviously we use the word purpose quite a lot, but do you know that, that there's that Japanese concept, ikigai, which is like the, the reason for being, which if for anyone who doesn't know, who's just sort of working through this question in their own minds, the Ikigai is like this extraordinary interlocking four circles. Uh, and each circle has some, represents something different. So you have what you love, uh, what you're good at, which often are connected, um, what the world needs. So you're thinking about actual real human needs out there in the world, but then also what you can be paid for. And sort of the, the icky guy is like this incredible intersection of these of these four things. And for anyone who hasn't 
come across it before, check it out. Go, go and, and look at that online because you can do it. You can do it for yourself. And even just in 10 minutes, you can start to get a sense. Uh, and I think for some people, they have a very clear idea of their vocation. Others don't. But we can all enter into this period of reflection to think about exactly where that sweet spot is between what the world needs and what we do. Um, in terms of what can I add, well, Alex has already mentioned this idea, and, and you've already mentioned, Cassie, the idea of the complexity and the idea of being able to <clears throat> navigate complexity. Um, I don't know if it's already there, really. It is kind of sort of between the lines, I would say, already of resilience and learning and unlearning. I think they're sort of already there. But I think this, this idea of um, being able to navigate complexity, to be, to be able to deal with high levels of unknowability and unpredictability, we, you know, what's happened this year is only going to be more of this, right? I think we can sort of agree on that, right? It's like this isn't a once-off and then we're back. Um, there's no normal that we're going back to. And so we need to get comfortable or as comfortable as possible with this new, highly, highly complex environment that we're within. And I think that there, um, Alex has mentioned the, the idea of, of testing and failing quickly. This is the way in which we deal with complexity. The way in which you deal with complex systems and environments is different to very stable environments. But the, but the good thing is we do have tools uh, for applying and acting in these places. The, the, the final one I'd like to say, which again could be sort of there in digital and physical worlds, but I'd like to kind of just maybe develop it further a little bit, is um, this idea of humanity and technology together. Because I think there's a lot of talk about automation that's going on, and it's, it's a fact that we're moving into this um, you know, incredible new era of much more of our work being automated. And there are major issues that are gonna happen with this. There are jobs that are going to disappear and some new jobs will appear as well. But there, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's the downside, if you like, of automation. Um, but I sometimes think when we look at these big um, statistics of you know, X percentage of jobs are gonna go in the next few years, I kind of think that there's part of this which sometimes gets missed, which is that even though we're moving to a higher levels of automation, it's not that every job is going to become 100% automated, right? What we're actually moving into is a long period of human machine or human technology interaction and integration. There's going to be so many jobs that need a human being together with the technology, right? So this is the, this is the beauty. This is the magic. It's about people who hold on to their humanity and hold on to that stuff that we talked about, you know, in terms of values and answering real needs, like you said, of, you know, instead of doing an app for, for, for you know, just innovating for innovating sake, finding the real human need, following through with that. And that's a real humane and human aspect. But then also, you know, embracing the technology, you know, dancing with the robots, being, being at one with the technology. And instead of a sort of science fiction, oh, the robots are going to take on over our, our, our jobs, you know, no, like there's going to be a profound, prolonged period of this interaction. And we need people that are comfortable with it and able to, to do it, but also without, without losing that human upside. Uh, that's great. Uh, I really like what you said, and uh, we are going to have like this next few hours discussions about the Green New Deal, which I think it shows an opportunity to see uh, the transition to low or zero carbon economies and societies as an opportunity, not like a, a burden. And I think that's what we have to promote with the Day of the Climate Professional and other initiatives that. Uh, if someone will lose the job because uh, we are going to stop the coal mines, we have to find a better job, paying better, with more um, uh, safety in the renewable energy industry. So it's possible, uh, we'll, and we can do this, and I really like that you mentioned. And, and the resiliency we saw with youth climate leaders, we, we changed uh, the whole YCO course in April in two weeks because uh, we had to make these online and we were able to triple the number of participants. So if you, if you feel the trend and if you prepare yourself and you have a flexible team, it's possible to 
do that. And, we, and at the same time, we need uh, this community that will support us because it's overwhelming to be in such a world and we cannot uh, take this for granted. We are coming now to the final minutes of this panel. So perhaps each of you could make a question to the other and while you answer your final considerations too. Who wants to start? Alex, well, I can I ask you a question? Of course. <laughs> yeah, great. Okay, so in your, in your book, uh, Autodiscipline and Aprendizagem, like self-discipline in learning, um, you describe various different elements that are important to increasing self-discipline in our learning. And when I was looking over this, two areas that I find particularly interesting that you write about um, are a person's environment and a person's routine. And one of the things that I like about this is that we sort of in our, we think that we can be very intentional with our behavior change. Ah, I'm going, I, I want to change it therefore. And that's part of it, in my understanding of it, you, you know more than me, that's part of it. But so much of it is our environment and so much of it is the routines. It's the habits that we develop, right? So I wanted to see if you could share with us um, any tips um, for people listening of, of how can they improve their environment and their routine in order to improve their learning? Perfect, John. Thank you for this question. I really love to talk about that. So for me, it's a real pleasure to answer that. So the first thing, I, I, I think it's important for us to, to highlight that. It's like in the future that is already happening, learning is work and work is learning. So it is like paramount for us to identify the different paths that we need uh, in order to keep learning all the time. That's what, what I talk in my lectures, in my books, like how to, we keep learning all the time. And then I, uh, I made a research with, my, with people with my networks. And one of the main challenges people have, and it appeared in that research, when they try to direct their own learning is lack of discipline. This is like huge. It's the main problem. And for so long, schooling have, has made us believe that if there is no one requesting us to finish a task, then we will never finish it. So first it was our parents, then our teachers, and finally our bosses. So we have to kind of unlearn this pattern and start practicing another one, which I call self-discipline, which is in, in this ebook that you mentioned. This is a kind of discipline that can't be imposed it only emerges like from the inside to the outside. And there are many strategies a person can use to nurture this kind of self-discipline. And two of them are like, as you mentioned, like manipulating the environment and changing the routines. So I've, I will give an example of a thing that happened with me. So I've, I've already used a, a combination of environment and routine strategies to help me write a book. It was one of the first ones that I published. So what I did, it was I created a monthly crowdfunding campaign for people to financially support me writing the book. And then I promised them that I would publish like three small blog posts every week. They could expect that. So for three months and a half, I did it. And the, the pressure on me to not skip a day was huge since like many people were trusting literally their money on my work. So then I gathered all the blog posts and organized them into a book, which I made available for free for the supporters. And then the crowdfunding campaign was like an environmental change in my environment because now a bunch of people were expecting me to deliver. So it was like a <laughs> commitment with those people. And like the, the, the writing three small pieces three times a week, that was this, the road chain part. So this is what I call a public commitment strategy. And this is really, really useful for us in achieving any goal, anything we can achieve, we, we, we would like to achieve. So. Excellent. Can I ask you a question, Tom? Please. <laughs> I would love just to keep talking about that, but please, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a lovely subject. But yes, I, I have a, a question that I think it would be really interesting as well. So we had 
Fridge of Capra here, his video was really loving. So uh, I thought it was interesting to quote him. And he says in an interview that I read, and uh, that quote, in order to achieve the changes we want, we need to create and nurture communities as nature does. So instead of seeking happiness buying products, we must seek satisfaction in community life. So I, as I mentioned before, I see communities as places where we can feel at home, we can be fully ourselves, and we can, we can connect fully with other people. We have this kind of psychological safe, and we, we, we feel safe in, this, in these spaces. So in your experience with Mandala and your, and your professional experience, do you think it's possible to turn companies into communities? And it, it, it relates with the, the organizational culture answer that you were telling us. So how could leaders do that? And how would you do that? Great, great. Well, I think the short answer to the question is yes. I think, I think actually community is a nice um, way. It's a nice frame. It's a nice way of thinking about what an organization is. Alex, I really liked what you, when you talked about community earlier on, you said, look, it's the creating things together, learning together, living together, you know, and I, and I was kind of listening to all of that and I was going, yeah, that's exactly what a good organization is uh, or should be, you know, and I think that um, the idea of having a shared purpose and, and focus together, but working together, giving space to individual, but also uh, to the collective, I think, you know, that's what, that's a good community for me. So I think that the, the, the answer in terms of can organizations uh, be communities. I think yes, they can. And I think also the type, the organisations themselves are changing. Right, we're living in a digital interdependent world. It's it's the world of the network. You know, we're speaking now, and we're all in different parts of the world, and this is the norm. You know what I mean? So that the notion of what an organisation itself is becoming more fluid. Like we said earlier on, organisations just collections of people, and the way in which people connect is, is changing I think so I think organizations I hope I think the good organizations are going to become more like communities right um, in terms of the role of a in terms of the role of a of the leader in all of this well um, I mean I think we've, we've already touched upon what the leader needs to do they need to um, uh, provide that shared sense of purpose they know obviously need to be the the example for sort of how the community interacts um, one big area I think that we've talked about or we've, we've worked on at Mandala, which is very, very important, I think for communities and I think for organizations too, is the idea of psychological security. The idea that you're, you're creating a space in which people can be themselves, Alex, like you said, you know, they can bring, you know, this idea you can bring your whole self to work. I think the, the last few months of the pandemic particularly have sort of accelerated this complete dismantling between the professional and the personal. You know, before, not, you know, it's been happening for a while, but basically the idea that you're a different person at work than when you are at home is just nonsense, right? It's like you have to be yourself. You have to be authentic. And that's how you create good cultures. But in order to, for that to happen, you need to make sure that the people that are, not just the leaders, but the people sort of in key parts of this community or, or organization are providing psychological security for people um, and making sure that they feel safe and they can be themselves. So I think that's a big, big part of it. Um, but yeah, there's, I mean, there's lots, there's lots other uh, to it too. You recommended a book. I'll give a recommendation as well, which is um, uh, Frederick Laloux, uh, Reinventing Organizations, which is very good um, uh, for anyone who's sort of interested in culture and organizational change and the new types of organizations that are taking form today and going to be the leaders into the 21st century. It's a very good one for everyone. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Like we could be the whole 24 hours discussing thank those you. topics. Absolutely. Like uh, we need to perhaps start like a series together. I'm really looking forward to reading uh, the recommendations of you both. And we are going to share this on our landing page. So if you didn't roll, write anything, like go to our website, after the panel and you can see the links and, and, and have all the recommendations. We will keep now talking, move into a totally different topic, which is food. But thank you so much for being with us. And we see you on the other panels. Thank you and...